We left off the end of fit one. We're going to pick up line 444. Green Knight holds up his head, shows it to the noblest, that is, the royalty on the dais. Its eyes open, and the mouth speaks. And Sir Gowan's probably thinking, well, gee, this is a cool trick. <laughs> See, Gawain, that you carry out your promise exactly, line 448. And search for me truly, sir, until I am found. As you have sworn in this hall, in the hearing of these knights, make way your way to the green chapel, I charge you to get such a blow as you have dealt, rightfully given, to be readily returned on New Year's Day. As the knight of the green chapel, I am widely known, so if you make a search to find me, you cannot possibly fail. Therefore, come or merit the name of Craven Coward. Okay? This is what you agreed to, so if you don't show up, you're a coward. Get Jerks the horse's reins, rides back out. And we're told, 450, excuse me, 460. What land he returned to, no one there knew, any more than they guessed where he had come from. What then? Seeing the green man go, the king and Gawain grin, yet they both agreed they had a wonder scene. Well, what did Arthur, what did the narrator tell us Arthur needed before he would take the first bite? A marvelous sight. A marvelous sight or a wonderful tale or a tale of some kind of wonder. Well, he's, he's kind of gotten both. Okay? So what do they do? They dig in. And we get part two. Okay? So that was New Year's Day. Why is Sir Gowan grinning? Is it like, oh, no, type grin, or is it a... He's got another year to live. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's a good question. It began as a what? As a game. What did he think would happen when he took that swing? That uh, the Green Knight would die? Yeah, that he'd win, and the game essentially would be over. But Arthur says, look at line 470, before we get to fit two. Dear lady, let nothing distress you today. Who's the dear lady? Miss Queen. Guinevere. Let nothing distress you today. Such strange goings on are fitting at Christmas, putting on interludes, laughing and singing, mixed with courtly dances of ladies and knights. Nonetheless, I can certainly go to my food, for I have witnessed a marvel I cannot deny. So he tells Sir Gowan, hang up your axe. They hang it above the dais on a piece of tapestry. Everyone gazes on it. This marvelous tale. They walk down, and they dig in, okay? Part two, what happens relatively quickly? Our narrator takes us through the seasons of the year, because that happened on New Year's Day, all right? So, the new year, the year was newborn, and what do we hear? 500, and so that you all went by the year ensuing, each season in turn, following the other. After Christmas came mean-spirited Lent. Does that mean mean-spirited? Does that mean angry? No, it means when the spirit becomes mean, that is little. Why? Because they're fasting, they're praying, okay? That tries the body with fish and plainer nourishment. But then the weather on earth battles with winter, spring comes, fields open, woodlands put on new leaves. We skip a bunch. Summer season comes when Zephyrus blows softly on seeding grasses and plains, or as Chaucer puts it. Why, do I, why does it always happen? Train of thought just completely went off the tracks. Opening line of General Prologue. I've got it. I mean, I've got like the first eleven lines memorized, and I can't for the life of me remember it. Anyways, summer comes, goes, autumn starts to come. Line five twenty one. Okay, fierce winter, fierce winds come. Five thirty, 
Winter comes round again as custom requires a truth. Now, 530 isn't referring to solstitial winter, that is, December 21st. We're talking about Northwest England winter. From your perspective, if I'm England, over here, okay? London's down here, area around Chester. What does that mean, Northwest England winter? Yeah, <laughs> summer ends, you know, relatively early compared to here. So late October, it's getting cold. Until the Michaelmas moon brought him of winter's frost and into Gwaine's vine, he starts to think, ah, it's about time for me to go. Yet until All Saints Day, he lingers in court. When is All Saints Day? Day after Halloween, because Halloween is All Hallows' Eve. Hallows there means saints. All Saints' Eve. All Saints' Day, November 1st. So he waits until November 1st. Arthur makes a big old feast. 545. Sir Gallen says, time for me to go. You know the terms of this matter. I have no wish to bother you with them. Tomorrow I set sail, or excuse me, I set out without fail to seek this man in green as God will direct me. And all the knights get together and we have them named, 551 and following. They give him advice, etc., etc. Notice 558, much deep sorrowing was heard in the hall that one as noble as Seguin should go on the quest to stand a terrible blow. Why are they sorrowing? They pretty much know he takes a blow like that. He's not going to hold his head up and talk anymore. And Sir Gawain says, What should I fear? For whether kind or harsh, a man's fate must be tried. Tried. Tested. Proven. He's saying. So, he stays there all that day. Next day he makes ready. And we get a long description. 567 to 5. about 5, excuse me, about 667. So about 100 lines is given to describe what? His armor. His armor, his accoutrements, his clothing, why? Who cares? Stalling. Is it stalling? What is um, the wearing of the dyes? Could be a display of his credentials as a knight. What else could it say? What is a primary, not necessarily the, but what is a primary rule for writers? What must writers know? Okay, what else? That's a lie, by the way. An awful lot of writers just tell. And they're good writers. Okay, what else? Okay, what else? It's more obvious than both those. Be specific. Louder? Be specific. Okay. Who are you writing for? I got to know your audience. And these are a bunch of nobles. Who? That's exactly right. The audience of Sir Gallon and the Green Knight is. I'm, I'm going to use a word, and it might be slightly misapplied, but it's essentially aristocratic. These are barons, dukes, knights, etc. They're the upper class. These are not a bunch of serfs sitting around a fire in a hovel listening to this. Let's use modern language. The audience is the 1%. It's not the 99%. Because the 99% would think what of the description of Sir Gallon? Okay. Okay, what else though? This guy is being dressed how? In rich clothing, expensive clothing. 
Meanwhile, you're sitting there in a hair shirt around your puny little wimpy fire eating crap <laughs> while the 1% is living it up. Okay? No. It's not directed towards the lower class. It's directed towards the upper class. Okay? So we get all this description of his ornamentation, description of the armor, and I've got a colleague, Professor Reed, who's really into armor. And he's pretty sure that the armor itself shows, and, and how Sir Gowan is armed, shows the poem probably couldn't have been written after 1375 because some armor is very dateable down to decades, an individual decade, okay? And Ryan has, has essentially argued to me, at least, over beer and cigars. He's pretty sure it's no later than 1375. So we get all the armor, and then page 242, where, let's see here, we get his bridle. Finally, they bring out his shield. 619. Then they brought out the shield of shining jewels with the pentangle painted on it in pure gold. He swings it over his baldic, throws it around his neck, where it suited the knight extremely well, and why the pentangle should fit that noble prince, I intend to explain, even though that should delay me. In other words, you gotta hold with me, folks. I gotta explain what this pentangle thing is. It's a symbol that Solomon designed long ago as an emblem of fidelity. What's the pentangle again? The five-pointed star. Five-pointed star. Not the Star of David. It's a six-pointed star, if I remember correctly. Okay. Solomon designed this long ago as an emblem of fidelity. What's fidelity? Faithfulness. Truth. Not truth like 2 plus 2 equals 4, but your truth. You, not like well, this is my truth. It might be different from your, okay, not that kind of truth. Your word, your integrity, okay? It's a figure consisting of five points where each line overlaps, locks into another. And it's also called in English, as I'm told everywhere, the endless knot. So it suits Sir Gallen and his shining arms. Why? Because he's always faithful in five ways. These are the five points. One, two, three, four, five. But each of those five points has five sub-points, if you want to it. So actually, he's faithful in 25 ways. Okay? Five times in each case. He was reputed. Reputed. What does that mean? He had a reputation. He has a reputation as virtuous like refined gold. Devoid of all vice and with all courtly virtues adorned. We'll go back to the beginning of the poem. Why did Sir Gowan say he should be the one to take on the Green Knight and not King Arthur? He's a lot more expendable. Okay, he's expendable. What else? The only reason I get to sit at the big table on Ari is because of my relationship to you, because you're my Uncle Artie. Okay? And he says, oh, I'm not the brightest of the bunch either. So, he bears this new painted sign. We get a long description of the pentangle, and then what happens to it? It's never referred to again in the entire poem. In fact, the poet said that the pentangle is well known. Pentangle doesn't show up in any other place of English medieval literature. This is the only instance. Okay. So, first, he's judged perfect in his five senses. He's perfect in his seeing. That doesn't mean he's got 20-20 vision. It means he doesn't see wrongly. He doesn't see things he shouldn't see. He doesn't look at things he shouldn't look at. He doesn't have, you know, a copy of, I don't know, pick your porn. 
stuffed down in his saddlebag. Right? He's perfect in his hearing. He doesn't listen to things he shouldn't listen to. Gossiping, that kind of stuff. He's perfect in his speaking. He doesn't lie. He doesn't say bad things about other people. You know, bear false witness, that kind of stuff. He's perfect in his touching. He doesn't touch things he shouldn't touch. You'll probably get him in trouble with the courtly love tradition because there you're supposed to touch things you shouldn't touch. And what's the other one? Tasting. He doesn't taste things he shouldn't taste. Okay? So five senses. Next is five fingers. Never lost their dexterity. He didn't suffer from, you know, arthritis or other problems. It's kind of interesting. Focuses on the five fingers. Both hands. He doesn't only have one hand. Okay? Uh, what else? His earthly faith is in the five wounds that Christ suffered on the cross. Crown of thorns. Hands and feet, side. Okay. As the creed declares, and wherever this man found himself in battle, his fixed thought was that above all things, all his fortitude should come from the five joys that the mild queen of heaven found in her child. So what are those five joys again? I had it written over here somewhere. Annunciation. The Annunciation, which was what? March 25th, or whatever year it was, BC 4, or BC 7, or, you know, it doesn't really work because it's when he comes. But March 25th is according to when the church celebrates it. The Annunciation. That's when Gabriel comes to Mary and says, You'll have the Son of God. Behold, full of grace. Okay? You'll have the Son of God. She says, Be it unto me as you have said. That's the first one. What's the next one? Incarnation, that's when she actually gets pregnant, which happens almost immediately after the Annunciation, like, bing. Okay. What's next? The resurrection. Resur Did I not add crucifixion? Uh, it's resurrection, ascension, and assumption. Yeah. There are two different lists for those. So you have the Annunciation. Two, in car. Three, according to some, um, crucifixion. Four, resurrection. Five, ascension. Another list has one, two, this becomes three, this becomes four. And five is the assumption, or it's also called the dormition of Mary. When Mary dies and her body whoop, goes to heaven, okay. right at that moment. So this list or this list, there's just a slight difference, okay? So where is the pentangle painted on Sir Gowan's shield? In the center. Where? Yeah, it's on, in the center, but where? It's on the outside. Where is the image of Mary painted? The inside. It's on the inside. So that when he sticks his shield, his hand, through the straps and holds that shield up, Mary's right there. He can see her image, her icon, and be strengthened by that. Okay? For this reason, the gracious knight, line 648, had her image depicted on the inside of his shield, so that when he glanced at it, his heart never quailed. The fifth group of five the man respected, I hear, was generosity, that's one, love of fellow men above all, that's, I think I had down, fellowship, purity, courtesy, what is courtesy again? Manners. Manners of court. It's courtly manners. Okay. And then the last one? Compassion. What does compassion mean? Literally, it's co passionis. Co suffering. It's empathy. So he takes, he shows 
sympathy or shares empathy with other people suffering. He takes on their burdens. He tries to help them. That's all part of the Pentecost oath. Okay? Helping people when they're down, essentially. These noble five were more deeply implanted in that man than any other. So, according to this poet, not Lancelot, not Tristan, not Boris, not Bedivere, not Agravain, not Yvain, not even Percival, the guy who in the Arthurian tradition is granted to gain the Holy Grail because of his purity. Sir Gowan isn't, by the way, in the Arthurian tradition. Sir Gowan's, you know, he's crap compared to Percival. Okay? So, all these five groups are embodied in that night, each one linked to the others in an endless design, based upon five points that was never unfinished, not uniting in one line or separating another, without ending anywhere at any point that I find, no matter where the line began or ran to an end. Therefore, the knot was fashioned on his bright shield. So it doesn't have, you know, like things like this. It's all perfectly, <coughs> no beginning, no end. Notice, each one inextricably linked with the other. So point two is tied to point four. Point two, point two is tied to point three. Point five, point one, four with three, two. You can do all the permutations. So what happens? So if you do break one of the points, it all falls apart. Okay? So he gets on his horse. What's his horse's name? He is named, by the way. That will show up on a quiz. I love those little nitpicky little things. Gringolette. He gets on his horse, Gringolette, and he rides. Now, where does he ride to? Okay, where are they beginning at? Carlisle. I mean, is that this one or is that Longhorn? Um, no, nope, that's Arthur. That's not the beginning. Sorry, I'm just, my brain's not working today. Yeah, this one, they're just at Camelot. It's in Lawnval that is set in the beginning at Carlisle. Um, so, he starts to ride off. Problem is, we don't know where Camelot is. It's like my Shakespeare class. If you can figure out who Shakespeare wrote the sonnets to, if you can figure out who the, the dedicatory letter says, you know, that they're written to H.W., if you can figure out who that is, you can pretty much name your chair of English anywhere in the world, like Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, etc. Where every, I mean, if everybody agreed to it. If you discovered Camelot, name your chair of archaeology. I mean... You'd be on every major new. I mean, Trump election, pfft, nothing compared to discovering the real Camelot. Okay, so if you could find that, it'd be huge. Why? Because we've been looking for a while. Okay, what else? <laughs> what would it supposedly prove? That King Henry existed. Arthur's real, and there's nothing people want really more than you know that kind of stuff. So he starts off from Camelot, but we don't know where Camelot is. So, 691, he rides through the realm of England. Maybe Camelot is Colchester, which some authors have claimed. Colchester, let's see, London is here, your perspective. London is here. Colchester is slightly north and east. Takes about an hour to get there from London, okay? It's one of the oldest towns, in fact it is, if I remember correctly, the oldest Roman town in Britain. Some have claimed that's Camelot. Some have claimed London here, way over here, coastal Wales, Tintagel is where Camelot was. Others claim Carlisle, which is way up here. Some have claimed Edinburgh 
is where Camelot was, okay? Bunch of different places. So he rides throughout, because we don't know where, maybe it's all of them. He rides throughout England to look for the Green Knight. He makes his way to the very north part of Wales, 697. All the Isles of Anglesey, he keeps on his left. So if I'm the map now, Wales comes up like this. Anglesey is this big island off here. Okay, You go to Anglesey, you leave from Holyhead, which I'm pretty sure is on Anglesey, to take a ferry to go over to Ireland. So he's coming up this way because he's keeping Anglesey on his left. Crosses over the fords at the headlands, there at the Holy Head, and came ashore again in the wilderness of Wirral. There is a place, it's still called Wirral in Wales today. Few people lived there whom either God or good hearted men could love. And one of the things that's described there in terms of the people that he meets is he meets the woes men, the mad men. The woes men are, the, if you're a Tolkien nerd, are the same gone, bury, gone, and the woes men that Gandalf and Pippin, excuse me, Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli, etc., meet when they're um, riding with um, Theoden for a while. Or Merry and, and Theoden, not Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli. So he keeps going, and what does he have to fight off while he's doing this travel, while he's fighting? What various things does he battle? We're told. Like an ogre, right? A dragon? Look, line 720. Sometimes he fights dragons and wolves as well. Sometimes with wild men. Look in the left hand paragraph, uh, left hand column, because that's the Middle English, Northwest Midlands dialect. Sumwila. With wild wolves. Those are the wood men that wandered in the canals who dwelled in the crags. So sometimes he fights with dragons, sometimes wolves, sometimes wild men, bulls, bears, and boars, and ogres who chased him across the high fells. High fells, that's almost redolent of the misty moors in Grindel. Not saying it is, but it's similar. Had he not been valiant, resolute, trusting in God, he would surely have died. But he is valiant, and resolute, and trusting in God, therefore he lives. So he goes on. Remember, he left when? Beginning of November. Beginning of November, and now it's Christmas Eve, little ones. 735, or 734, the night rides across the land until Christmas Eve alone. So he's all alone, it's Christmas Eve. And we get in what's called the wheel, the way the poem is composed is you have what's called a bob and a wheel. And the wheel is the four shorter lines. Earnestly Gawain then prayed Mary that she send him guidance to some place where he might lodging find. He prays to Mary to intercede, send me guidance so I can find a place to spend the night. But it's more than just spending the night. It's because of what he wants to do on the morrow. And in the morning, Christmas Day, in splendor he rides into a dense forest wondrously wild. High slopes, massive oaks, hazel, hawthorn, lots of moss, Miserable, miserable birds singing. The night on Gringolet hurries under the trees through many a morass and swamp, etc. Why? Christmas Day is almost drawn to a close, and what has he not done? Found the Green Knight. Okay, other than that. Bingo. Pray. Christmas Day is what? Christ. Mass. He hasn't had mass. He hasn't been to a service celebrating the Eucharist, okay? And this is one of the major, you know, important holy days of the year. So trouble about his plight, line 750, lest he should be unable to attend Mass for that Lord who on that same night 
was born of a maiden, our suffering to end. So he wants to acknowledge, pay homage, so to speak, to Christ. And so what does he do? Notice, it's getting dark. The day is drawing to a close. And so he prays. I beg of you, Lord, and Mary, who is gentlest mother so dear, for some lodging where I might devoutly hear Mass and your matins tomorrow. Humbly I ask, and to this end promptly repeat my pattern and Ave in Creed. Now when he asks for your matins tomorrow, I think what he's talking about is the day after Christmas in the church is called the Synaxis of Mary. That's when all the angels, according to the church tradition, all the angels pray and thank Mary for what she did for humanity. Probably that's what he's talking about. So he prays to God and Mary and then promptly repeats his potter, potter noster, the Our Father, his Ave, Ave Maria, Hail Mary, full of grace, and the Creed, and he recites the Creed. Those are the kind of the, the very basics of prayer. He sees lodgings. Bewailing his misdeeds and praying as he rode, he often crossed himself and says, Prosper me, Christ's cross. And hardly had he done it the third time. And he sees through the trees a moated building. He finishes his prayers, and there's a castle. He goes up to the castle knocks on the door and we're told he's allowed in. Let's see here. Picking up exactly where. The porter opens the door. Stationed on the wall, greeted the questing knight. 8-11. Sir Gowan says, Good sir, will you carry my message to the master of this house? to ask for lodging. Yes, by St. Peter, said the porter, I truly believe you welcome. You are welcome to stay as long as you please. So he comes back. They lower the drawbridge. Why? Because it's a moated castle. He rides across the moat, excuse me, the drawbridge. Okay. They get down on their knees to help him in and such. And he comes into the open courtyard and is escorted into the hall. Uh, let's see here. Line 835. He meets the Lord of the Hall. Not named. Who says? He gets in there blazing fire. And if you've ever been to a real castle, I don't mean the piddly little one over in, you know, Nolansville or Triune. It's a, it's a castle wannabe. I mean, a real castle. You know, some of these fireplaces, I've been to one that has a fireplace opening about half the size of that wall. I'm big, okay? The ones in the kitchen can be that big easily. Because if you're cooking for 100 people, you have to have a lot of stuff on the fire at once. So, he comes in and he says to Sir Gowan, You are welcome to do as you please with everything here. All is yours to have a command as you wish. Now, you can take that to just, the guy's being polite. You know, everything here is yours. Just, you know, make yourself a, at home. Make yourself comfortable. He might just mean that. Or he could mean it literally. Everything here is yours to have in command as you wish. Remember what the fairy lady said to Sir Lonville? I am yours to have in command as you wish, whatever you want. Sir Gowan, thanks indeed. Christ repay your noblesse. So they hug each other. Sir Gowan studies the man. And you're a big sucker. That's what the uh, great sized knight indeed in the prime of life, broad and glossy was his beard, all reddish brown, stern face, standing firmly on powerful legs. 
face fierce as fire, noble in speech, who truly it seemed capable, it appeared to Gowan, of being master of a castle with outstanding knights. This guy's huge. Gowan doesn't go, hmm, you remind me of somebody. So the Lord leads him to a chamber. He has a serving man assigned to him. Gowan sees the bed, curtains of pure silk, 854, shining gold borders, elaborate coverlets. Why does this bed have curtains? Oh, because of the daylight. Okay. Why else? You don't go to bed, well, most people don't, during the day. Insects? No. Warmth. Louder? Warmth. It's a castle. Castles are notoriously drafty. And castle walls aren't insulated. So if this was castle stone and you're in northern England and it's the middle of Winter. December, what happens to that stone? It gets cold. It gets really cold. And what does the cold do? Suck the heat out. It radi even though radiate is the wrong word, it radiates cold. Okay. The coldness doesn't just stay there. Okay. So you sleep. Think, you know, we're coming up on that season. If you've ever seen a Christmas carol, a good version of a Christmas carol, what does Scrooge sleep in? He sleeps in a four-poster bed with curtains all around it. Why? Because the curtains help kill any draft that might be in the room from Possible problems in the chinking of the castle. I used to live, just before my wife and I got married, I lived in a quote-unquote summer cabin built on top of Lookout Mountain because we went to a school there. The cabins were built in the 1940s. They were built for summer vacationers. We, I lived in it year-round. The, the year that we got married, 1985, that January was one of the coldest, had one of the coldest spells in the south in over 100 years. Top of Lookout Mountain, it did not get above zero for three days. That cabin, I could look, you know, where you see the lines of mortar, I could look between the logs and see daylight in most of the logs. I stapled blankets up, and at night, those blankets would move, okay? That's why he's got the four poster bed with the curtains. So, and notice, not just any curtains, we get descriptions of them. We get descriptions of the bedding. Why? Because people who have a lot of money to blow the aristocracy, they're concerned. They want to see how well is Sir Gowan being treated and such. Okay? So. So they can get those curtains. Yeah, chairs before the fireplace and such. Sir Gowan sits down to his meal. Men serve him. Right? He's tactfully questioned, asked discreetly who he is, where he comes from, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we're told they discover, 905, 906, that it was Gawain himself who was sitting there, having arrived there at Christmas as his fortune chanced. And when the lord of the castle heard who was his guest, he laughed loudly at the news, so deeply was he pleased. And all the men were overjoyed. Why? He's famous. Okay, he's famous. They were overjoyed to make the acquaintance quickly then of the man to whom all excellence and valor belongs. Sir Gowan is the model of excellence and valor, whose refined manners are everywhere praised, and whose fame exceeds any other persons on earth. Any, I mean, this is like John Lennon going, man, we're more famous than Jesus. His fame exceeds Lancelot's. Keep going. Yeah, Arthur. And they whisper to each other. Now we shall enjoy seeing displays of good manners, the irreproachable terms of noble speech, the art of conversation we can learn unasked. That is, I don't have to ask him, how do you say this word? Okay, now why did I just do that accent? Where are they? Close to Wales, weren't they? Yeah. 
They're in Nowheresville compared to the cultural cap. What's the cultural capital of the United States? Uh, Washington, New York. One of those two. Or the Washington, New York corridor, if you want. It's not where? Nashville. It's not Murfreesboro. Yeah, but you can go anywhere in the world and tell people you're from Nashville. Don't say Murfreesboro. And they'll know where that is. Yeah, actually, it's funny. Like, it's uh, I actually was talking to someone in Florida, and they were like, yeah, I've heard about Memphis and Nashville, but I've never heard of Memphis. Not Florida. Anywhere in the world. <laughs> My son studied for three months in Australia. They'd ask, where are you from? He'd say Nashville. Because if he said Murfreesboro, where the hell is that? Yeah, who cares? Country music. I mean, you can walk down any street in London. Say you're from Nashville. Oh, have you been to the Country Music Hall of Fame? Have you been to Johnny Cash's house? No. Okay. Yeah, it worked. It's, I mean, it's, it's really amazing. So where are they? They're in Murfreesboro. <laughs> and they want to find out how the big city slicker really talks and learn from him. Since we have taken in the source of good breeding, source, like Plato's world of forms, he is the model for good breeding. Does that mean, you know, he's a quote-unquote stud set out to breed? No. It means he's a good catch. <laughs> is that all? Well, Does it mean that he's raised You should well? try to emulate him as well. You should try to emulate this person. He has all the proper manners, all the proper characteristics. But yet he was the worst of his knights. Well, that's what he said at the beginning. Maybe. Truly God has been gracious to us indeed in allowing us to receive such a guest as Gawain. Okay? So, moreover, they will learn of knowledge of fine manners. Why? Because this man has expertise. I think that those who hear him will learn what love talk is. What do they mean, love talk? Courtly love. Yeah. What else? I mean, it's definitely that, but I think it could be even more specific. What did Andreas Kapalanis write or translate? How to um, win a woman. He's, he's Hitch, if you're familiar with the film. <laughs> He'll teach you. How to win the love of your life. Okay? So, they finish dinner. And they go off to church. 9.35. Gawain hastens there, smartly dressed, quickly arrives. The Lord takes him by the sleeve, leads him to a seat, greets him, calls him by name, says you're welcome. And then the lady, 9.41, wished to set eyes on the night and left her pew with many fair women. She was the loveliest on earth in complexion and features and figure and coloring, behavior above all others. Sounds like whom? Longville's lover. Longville's lover. And more beautiful than Guinevere, it seemed to the night. Don't let her hit. Yeah, really. He might lose his head again. Might lose his head. She comes to the chancel to greet him courteously with another lady leading her by the left hand. Question. Is the beautiful lady left hand holding the right hand of the other lady? Or is the other lady's left hand holding the right hand of the beautiful lady? Oh, like the wedding. It's the left hand of the beautiful lady holding the right hand of the other. Why is this important? The other lady was older than she, the beautiful one, more beautiful than Guinevere. The other one was older than she, an aged one, it seemed, respectfully treated by the assembled knights, but very different in looks were these two ladies. For where the young one was fresh, the other was withered. That is, the young one, beautiful complexion. The other one, a human sharpe. I mean, just all wrinkled beyond every part of that. One, 
beautiful one, rosily aglow. On that other, you thought I was kidding about the Sharpe. Rough, wrinkled cheeks hung in folds. Think of, uh, you know, the Emperor Palpatine in the Star Wars. I mean, just the George Soros kind of folds. Many bright pearls adorned the kerchiefs of one whose breast and white throat uncovered and bare. She's not walking around topless. It doesn't mean that bare. Low cut gown, okay? Because I've had students go. <laughs> Sean, more dazzling than snow, new fallen on hills. Yes, the hills are her breast, probably. The other wore a gorget over her neck. That is, she has like a nun's habit. And it's all the way up, sorry, all the way up to <laughs> cover. She does have a bit of a beard. <laughs> it's kind of like, uh, what's his name's Aunt Ruth and Veggie Tales. The other wore a go gorget over her neck, if you're familiar with Veggie Tales. Her swarthy chin. Yeah, I just heard somebody say swarthy. Because what does swarthy mean? Dark. Her swarthy chin wrapped in chalk white veils. Her forehead <coughs> folded in silk, muffled up everywhere, with embroidered hands and lattice work of tiny stitching, so that nothing was exposed of her but her black brows, her two eyes, and her nose. Her naked lips, which were repulsive to see, and shockingly bleared. <laughs> So what's it mean to have bleary eyes? They're kind of cloudy. Her lips are bleared. Kind of cloudy, kind of white. A noble lady indeed, you might call her by God. With body squat and thick and buttocks bulging broad. <laughs> this is, I nah, shouldn't go there. <laughs> Don't do it, Ted. <laughs> about to make a Kim Kardashian joke. <laughs> and buttocks bulging broad, more delectable in looks was the lady who she led. Okay? So, one, drop dead gorgeous swimsuit model. The other, not. <laughs> you don't need to say anything else. Just not. Short, squat, fat, wrinkled, not attractive to look at, all covered up. Probably could be a little bit more covered up. <laughs> Sir Gowan glanced at that beauty, notice, who favored him with a look. Now, in the courtly love tradition, this is kind of, you know, she, yeah, she's, she's signaling him. And taking leave of the Lord, he walked towards them. The older one, he salutes with a deep bow, showing sign of respect, but takes the other lovelier one briefly into his arms, kisses her respectfully, and courteously speaks. Now, takes her briefly in her arms. What does that usually mean? Does it, is that just a hug? No, yeah, I think it's... Take briefly in your arms kind of means... This kind of kiss, okay? But it's respectful. <laughs> we won't go any further. <laughs> they asked to make his acquaintance. Seems to me like he already has. And he quickly begs truly to be their servant, if that would please them. Why does he beg to be their servant? Because true love is... Uh... Two things. Chivalry, courtly love. In chivalry, you know, a lord of a castle has a bunch of knights and a bunch of been below those knights, etc., who all swear fealty to him. They also swear fealty to his wife. So he is saying, I'm your servant at your service. Okay. At your service can mean a whole bunch of things, as we will find out. So, they place him between them and lead him. Now, why is it, let me go back for a second. Why is it significant that the unattractive short squat one leads the beautiful one by the left hand? Anybody know what left is in Latin? 
sinistre. It's the word from which we get sinister. Okay? What does sinister mean? Think of the opening, you know, chords of bar. Uh, I was going to say opening bars, opening chords of jaws. That's sinister. Okay? So, yeah. That's good. <laughs> You're going to have to be in all my classes now, so when I do that, I can <laughs> cue the Jaws music. Okay? So he sits between them. They make merry. And on the next day, when everyone remembers the time when God who died for our salvation was born, line 997, 5, joy spreads through every dwelling on earth for his sake. So did it here. So they're just having a good time. In Gerwain... 10.03 and the lovely lady were seated together right in the middle of the table. Big old meal. We're going to skip a bunch. And jump to 10.35. So Gowan gets ready to, you know, go off to his room. And the host says to him, 10.35, As long as I live, I shall be the better because Gawain was my guest at God's own feast. That is at the Christmas feast. Sir God, ah, shucks, you know, it is really my honor. You know. I'm at your commandment to act on your bidding. He's putting himself in homage to the Lord of this castle. Why? As long as he's at this castle. Makes sense. As I'm duty-bound to in everything, large or small. He says, all right, why don't you stay a while? Sir God says, oh, no, I can't. I gotta, I gotta go find the green knight. Who... Lives at the Green Chapel. And, Jesus. and get my head cut off. Yeah. Go meet Jesus, you know. So, I would not fail to reach it, 1054, on New Year's morning, for all the land of England, so help me our Lord. Therefore, if you've ever heard of the Green Chapel, tell me how to get there. Okay? So I got to leave. I mean, I've only got three days to get there. 1070. Don't worry about it. Let the whereabouts of the green chapel worry you no more, for you shall lie in your bed, sir, taking your ease until light in the day, leave on the first of the year, and reach that place at midday to do whatever pleases you there. It's two miles away from here. He's like, oh, good. You can get some rest. Enjoy his last days on earth. Enjoy his last days on earth, you know. So, Sir Gallon thanks him. And... The host says, okay, you've agreed to carry out whatever task, whatever deed I ask. When did you make that agreement? I will serve you. I will serve you. Okay. So here's what I ask. Will you keep this promise? Yes, I will. So you're tired, traveling from far. You've reveled all night with me. You've not recovered from your loss of sleep, etc., etc. So <clears throat> tomorrow morning... Stay in your bed, sleep as late as you want, and after mass time, go dine when you like with my wife, who will be your companion until I get home. You stay, I'm, meanwhile, I will rise at dawn, and I'm going to go hunt. Okay, so let's make this agreement. What are we getting to? The exchange of winnings game. Whatever I catch in the wood, that'll be yours. And whatever mishap comes your way, you give me in exchange. So we'll swap. Cool? Cool. Okay, I agree. So someone brings them a drink, they drink on it. Part three. Early before daybreak, the household arose. That means... The business of running the castle gets to work. Okay. The knight, the lord of the castle, his men, they get ready to ride out. Okay, and have a grand old time. And what do they hunt on day one, day two, day three? 
Day one, they kill Bambi. Day two, a boar. Day three, Raynar the fox. A fox. Okay. Day one, and I know I'm jumping ahead, we'll, we'll come back to it. What does Sir Gowan give him? What does Sir Gowan win, mayhap? <laughs> While well, he says, days the day at the castle. Kiss. Day two. More kisses. Day three. More kisses. So, they're off hunting, and we're told, line 1179, and the good man, Gowan, or Gawain, lies in his fine bed. Or, to put it another way, meanwhile, back at the castle, and he's lying there, he's lazy, lazily dozed, and he hears what? Here's a noise at the door, and it's stealthily opened. Kind of raises himself up from his bed, pulls the bed curtains back a little bit, and it's the lady looking her loveliest, 1187, who quietly shuts the door. Doesn't go clank! Shuts the door, not making a sound, and towards the bed. And Sir Gowan's going, what the hell? <laughs> Let's the curtain back and lay down again, cautiously pretending to sleep. <sighs> and she approaches silently, stealing to his bed, lifts the bed curtain and crept within. That is, lifts the curtain, steps inside, closes the curtain. Hmm. And seated herself softly on the bedside, waited there strangely long to see when he would awake. So he's asleep on the bed. This is you know, a little twin bed. This is a big bed. She sits there, just sits there, and stares at him. <laughs> Bear in mind, he's awake. And he's sit sitting there thinking, okay, when's she going to leave? The night shammed sleep for a very long while, wondering what the matter could be leading to or portend. It seemed an astonishing thing. He says, well, maybe I should just find out what she wants. And he wakes and stretches, turns towards her, opened his eyes, and crosses himself, as if protecting himself by prayer and this sign. And with lovely chin and cheek, a blended color both, charmingly she spoke from her small laughing mouth. Good morning, Sir Gowan. Dude, she says, <laughs> you are an unweary sleeper that one can steal in here. Now are you caught in a moment? Okay, just for a moment, turn the tables. <laughs> She's in bed. He sneaks in and he goes, Hello, whatever your name is. <laughs> Got you. <laughs> what would we call that? Or what would this be leading to? Assault. Assault. Harassment. To put it minor, you know, in a very, very low key. Okay? Now are you caught in a moment? Unless we agree on a truce, I shall imprison you in your bed. Be certain of that. <laughs> Jamie's getting there going. Because what she's saying, you're mine. I am going to have what I want. Okay? Unless we agree on a truce. Courtly love tradition. What can a man not do to a woman? I'm not talking about rape. Okay, that's where I come to first. Deny it. How? Impolitely. Reject her in such a way that she feels rejected. Yeah, wrap your mind around that one. 
I shall imprison you in your bed. Yeah, you know what Freud would make out of that. <laughs> so he goes, oh, good morning, dear lady. You shall do with me as you push and that, as you please, as you wish, and that pleases me much. Why? Because he's already offered to be her servant. I am at your service. Service can mean a variety of things, right? Yeah. I will serve you or I will service you. For I surrender at once and beg for your mercy. Okay? Do with me as you wish. We already heard what the fairy queen meant by that in Lonmouth. And that pleases me much. I surrender at once. I beg for your mercy. And that is best in my judgment, for I simply must. In other words, what can I do? What can I say? Thus he joked in return. That is, our narrator tells us, this is all a jest. This isn't serious. She isn't going, take it off, buddy, because I'm going to rape you right here now. <laughs> okay? But he doesn't stop. But if you'd grant me leave and release your captive, ask him to rise, I would get out of this bed and put on proper dress. And then take more pleasure in talking with you. Can I, can I get up and get dressed? Implication is he's not wearing the very modern notion of pajamas. He is. Sleeping commando style. And she goes, no, 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 not indeed. No, no. I, I want you how you are. You shall not leave your bed. I intend something better. And his mind probably starts racing at this point. I shall tuck you in here on both sides of the bed. And then, chat with my knight, whom I have captured, for I know that you are Sir Gowan, etc. So tuck you in. He's lying there. How's she going to tuck him in? She's going to put one side over around his left shoulder, one hand around his right shoulder. She's going to tuck that blanket in. So in doing so, she's got to lean over him. <laughs> You're Sir Gowan. Everybody reveres wherever you go. Moreover, your good name and courtesy are honorably, honorably praised by lords and ladies alike. And now you are here, and we are alone. My husband and his men, they're gone. Other servants are in bed, my women too. The door's shut and locked. And since I have under my roof the man everyone loves, I shall spend my time well while it lasts with talk. <laughs> See, everything is building up to not with talk. You are welcome to me indeed. What does that mean? I am yours. Take whatever you want. Circumstances force me to be your true servant. Well, what circumstances? Okay. What are the very specific circumstances? How about the fact that she snuck up to his room, opened his door, went in, locked the door, climbed into his bed? Those are the circumstances that force her to be his true servant. And he says, oh, shucks, I'm greatly honored. I, I'm not such a man as you speak of to deserve such respect as you have just described. I am completely unworthy. That is, I don't deserve you. He's not saying, I don't deserve you, skag. He's saying, you are too great. Shut up, Siri. You are too great for me. You are too high for me. I am completely unworthy. I know very well. Well, you know, I should be happy indeed if you thought it proper that I might devote myself by words or my deed to giving you pleasure. What should he have left off of in that sentence? Okay. How about by deed? It'd, it'd be really cool if I could bring you great joy by words. 
We could talk. I could sing. I could read to you. Deed? That's always action. She goes, Sir Gallant, if the excellence and gallantry everyone admires, I were too slight or disparage. If I were to pretend that you didn't have that excellence and gallantry, that would be discourteous. That would hardly be courteous, she puts it. But a great many ladies would rather, much rather now hold you, sir, in their power as I have you here, to spend amusingly, spend time amusingly with your charming talk, delighting themselves and forgetting their cares. than much of the treasure or wealth they possess. But I praise that same Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that I have completely in my grasp the man everyone longed for through God's grace. So what does she mean? All the ladies in the world are going to be in my place right now. I think what that means is, ladies, put Esther Gallen, who you think all ladies would say, yeah, that's what she means. This is someone who could not be said no to. Whether you're married or not. That's what she means. And we're told, radiant with loveliness, great favor she conferred, and Sir Gowan, with virtuous speech, answered her every word. Notice, he answers. Anybody know what the word answer literally means? The A-N means against, and the swear doesn't mean swear. It's related to the word for sword. Sword against. When you answer, you are parrying with your verbal sword the other person's verbal thrusts. You're protecting yourself. He protects himself with verbal speech. And he says, may Mary repay you. Why? Because she swore by God. So he's kind of like, I see your God and I raise you one Mary. He realizes, this could get dicey. May Mary repay you. Why Mary? The virgin. Ever virgin. And that's the way we're going to keep this little situation right here. For I have truly made proof of your great generosity, and many other folk went credit for their deeds, but to respect them. And she goes, okay, I see you're Mary, and I raise you a Mary. By Mary? You're going to swear by Mary? I can do that too. To me, it seems very different. For if I were the worthiest of all women alive, and held all the riches of the earth in my hand, could bargain and pick a lord for myself, it'd be you. What about her husband? Yeah. He doesn't hold a candle to you, she says. For the virtues I have seen in you, Sir Knight, here of good looks and courtesy and charming manner. How courtesy? How has he shown courtesy in this little interview? He hasn't said, what the hell are you doing in my bedroom? Get out of here. Please. Right? He's done what? He has parried her words virtuously. Has he done anything to offend? No, he has not. No man on earth could be picked before you. And he said, no, 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 you've picked much better. Your husband, he's, he's great, you know. So they chatted 1280 of this and that until late morning. And always the lady behaved as if loving him much. What does as if mean? It's subjunctive, it's a conditional, it doesn't mean that she really does. And the knight reacted cautiously in the most courteous of ways, though she was the loveliest woman he could remember. He felt small interest in love. Why? He's thinking of getting his head cut off. In other words, I, I, I really don't want to enter into a long-term relationship at this point. Because <laughs> long-term here means three days, you know. But she was the loveliest woman he could remember. That is? Lovelier than one of us. 
Yeah, what else though? He's tempted. I mean, he's like, okay, should I turn this down? I mean, this go up. Nice to go out with a bang, you know. <laughs> I don't mean, <laughs> but it works. Okay, we will pick up with. Hold on, let me pick a marker out. We will pick up with twelve ninety. I surprise myself sometimes. <laughs>